Oh yeah! Hey guys, welcome to the second week of our series, The Hope of Glory. If you missed last week, allow me to just catch you up for just a moment so you kind of know what's going on and really kind of the vision behind this series before we jump into tonight's message. If you missed last week, um, I started off by talking about uh, how this is an exciting time in the life of our church. We're about to embark on this journey, about to do something that we've never done before as a church, um, and we probably will never do again. And that is the fact that we are going to be putting a building on our church property. Super duper exciting time in the life of our church, because if you didn't know, we've purchased land about two years ago on 8500 Archibald. If you don't know where that is, like if you're going on Archibald south towards Corona, it's this patch of land right before you go over the bridge and it turns into River Road. That is our property. If you drive past it, you'll see a big blue sign with like people acting like they're really happy, and it says Future Home of Vantage Point Church. Thank you, sir. Oh, two. Perfect. Um, and so if you want to come by and check out the land, you can do that at any time. But uh, the exciting thing is, starting this next year, 2015, we are going to be building our building. We're going to break ground this next year. And if all goes well, we will be walking into our church building December 2016. So super awesome, super exciting stuff. And if you didn't know this, we're actually going to have our very own Ignite building. How cool is that? So... So no more like parents dropping you off on a place that looks like a prison anymore. Uh, and you get to go to our very own Ignite building. It's going to be awesome. And uh, the idea behind this series is how you can be a part of making that happen. And you might be thinking, oh, I'm just a high school student. How am I going to help a church building, which is, if you didn't know, uh, a couple million dollars to do something like this? Uh, how could I be a part of something that big? Well, the cool thing about God, and this is what we're going to be learning throughout this series, is we often see it as, I can't help because I can't do very much. But God sees, it, God sees it a completely different way. God looks at the heart. God looks at um, your heart and what you're willing to give, not on an amount, but upon sacrifice. And that's what we're going to be talking about throughout this series. And last week, um, I talked about this idea. This is a challenge I gave to you, is uh, are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of your king? And we talked about the reality that Jesus is coming back one day, something that we don't often think about. It's so weird because as Christians, this is what we bank on. This is our whole faith that one day I'm going to go home to spend eternity with my, my Father in heaven and my Savior Jesus Christ. And yet it's something that we don't think about. We live like that's never going to happen, and yet that's what we claim to believe in. And so last week I kind of gave you this challenge of are you ready for your king and are you bringing glory to God or are you bringing glory to yourself? Um, the, really, the idea behind that is, is to begin to have you search your heart and, and begin to see, like, am I living for God's glory or my own glory? Well, tonight, we're going to be continuing our series by talking about another part of that. Uh, we're going to continue talking about this idea of, um, of being ready for Jesus' second coming. But last week was about waiting. Tonight, we're going to be talking about what we do while we're waiting. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, at least someone's excited to get into the Word of God tonight. Yes, Matthew 25, if you can't find it, it's very easy to find. First book of your New Testament, chapter 25, but if you still can't find it, find a cutie next to you, cuddle up with them, see if they can help you out. You're welcome, guys. Matthew 25. And uh, before we get into it, you'll see at the beginning of this chapter, um, it, you'll probably recognize this parable that you see at the beginning of Matthew 25, because it's what we talked about last week. We talked about the parable of the ten virgins, as it's called, and we learned that those ten virgins represent ten, ten bridesmaids. And we talked about how five of them were wise, but five of them were stupid, as Jesus called them. Five of them were ready Five of them were not. And we learned that the analogy that Jesus was giving here was that five were ready for the coming of what was called the groom. And the groom represented Jesus, but five were not ready. And Jesus compared that to us being ready for his second coming. Jesus said, be ready for me. Because I'm coming at a time that you do not expect me. Remember, we learned this last week, like a thief in the night. Remember that? That, that at a time we don't expect him, he's going to show up. And Jesus gave that example that like a thief in the night, and here's what's crazy. Jesus doesn't even know 
when he's coming. Did you know that? That Jesus says, not the angels, not even me. I don't even know when I'm coming. He says, only God the Father in heaven knows when he's going to send me to come back for you. So be ready at all times. And that was last week. And tonight, we're going to talk about the second parable that Jesus told. Because really, and this is what I want you guys to keep in mind right now, that these two stories, they're called parables, and I'll explain what a parable is in a second. But these two stories are parables. They were told in an answer to a question. Because remember, the disciples of Jesus, we talked about last week, they said, Jesus, how are we going to know when you're coming back? Which is a pretty important question if you're a Christian. Jesus, when will we know that you're about to come back? And Jesus told them a story, a parable, the first one we talked about last week. And then he told them this one that we're going to talk about tonight. And a parable, if you didn't know, is a story but it's a story that we don't know if it's true or not true. It could, have ha- it could be like something based off of real life that Jesus knows about and we just don't know about. Or it could be something he made up. We don't know. So we call it a parable. Something that, a story that Jesus told to illustrate a point. This was the second parable he told to illustrate the point of us always being ready. He says in verse 14, Matthew 25, verse 14. Again, Jesus speaking. And I really want you to envision him talking to you tonight because this does apply to you. So he is, and I want you to see it like this, telling you this story tonight. Jesus says again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So Jesus says again, or in other words, let me tell you another story to illustrate the importance of being ready for my coming. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Verse 15, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. I want to pause for just a moment and keep that verse up. Um, So Jesus says that this man, this master, um, he gave five bags of gold to one servant, two bags of gold to another, one bag of gold to another. Interesting that I looked up what these bags of gold actually are because if you didn't know um, the New Testament wasn't originally written in English it was written in Greek and we translate it to English this word where we get bags of gold from it doesn't actually mean bags of gold it means a weight of measure a weight of measure so let me kind of paint this picture to you that Jesus says to one he gave five weights of measure a very, very heavy weight. To another one, he gave two weights of measure, about half as much, and another he gave one weight of measure, just a little bit, not, nothing compared to the one he gave five weights of measure. And we're going to keep talking about bags of gold, but I'm going to come back to this idea of, of measures of weight because here's what I want you to understand, that although we talk about gold, this is the example we use because it's easy to understand, understand this, that what Jesus is saying is the master gave one five weights of responsibility. He gave another two weights of responsibility, about half as much responsibility. And then one, he gave just one weight of responsibility, not nearly as much as the five. And we're going to come back to this idea, but kind of keep that in your mind as we talk about bags of gold here. Verse 16, the man who received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work. Everybody say work. Say it like you mean it. Say work. He put his money to work and gained five bags more. Interesting. Verse 17. So also the one, who, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole, and took a poop in the hole. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say that. <laughs> dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. I just want to see if you're paying attention. Verse 19, wouldn't that be crazy if Jesus was telling the story and all of a sudden he's like, and he took a crap. No, I'm just kidding, guys. He didn't do that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. Verse 19, after a long time, the master of those servants, I just wonder, did he tell jokes like in the middle of a serious moment? I don't know. I just wonder sometimes. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Verse 20, the man who had received five bags of gold, he shows up, he's all excited, he brought to the master his five, and he goes, master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, but check it out, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant, you've been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things, come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came, master said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, but check it out, I have gained two more. 
His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. But then the man who'd received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, everybody say afraid. I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that I have returned and I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside who buried my treasure in the ground into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heavenly Father, as we study this passage of scripture, um, I ask that you would penetrate our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to the ones that are here, that you would open our hearts. um, And God, help us to understand it. Help us to... um, not misunderstand it and be filled with fear and try to run away from you. But Lord, help us to understand this so that it can change our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So here we have um, this story. And it's the second parable Jesus told to help us understand that what? That we should always be, anybody remember? Ready. That we should always be ready, right? And he tells this story, and here's what's interesting, is as we continue talking about readiness, last week was about waiting, right? Ten bridesmaids waiting for a wedding, as it often feels like if you've ever been on a wedding day, you just wait. Dear God, will they ever get married so I can go home? That's what a wedding feels like. Ten bridesmaids waiting for a wedding. And Jesus wants us to understand this. He wants us to get this picture that this is how we are to be, that we're to be waiting for the big day, waiting for the coming of of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But just so we're clear, Jesus says, I don't want anybody to get confused here, that although you should have your wedding clothes on, that although you should be ready for me to come back, don't misunderstand, you're not just waiting, you're to be working while you're waiting. That while you wait, you're to work, that you're to do something. And if you think about it, doesn't that make sense? Like, imagine going to a job, and imagine showing up, and... Uh, you know, they tell you, okay, this is how much money you're going to make. And you show up to the job, and, and you're like, okay, now what do you want me to do? And they're like, just, just chill. Just, you know, kind of do whatever. And you're like, oh, like that guy who's sleeping? Yeah, yeah, you know, just, just do whatever you want to do. But how does one go about getting raises because, like, I need more money? And they're like, no, just, just, we pay him a lot because we like him. But he gets paid the same even though we like him very much. But everyone pretty much gets paid the same thing, and there's no, you can't really earn any more money. You're just kind of stuck. I mean, how stupid would it be to be at a job where you cannot get a raise, everybody gets paid the same, no matter how lazy they are, why would you want to work hard? I mean, seriously, what does it matter? Just sleep like Billy, and you'll get paid the same. And, and how stupid would it be if, if Christianity was just all about waiting? And then if you come to church, who cares? Stay at home like Billy, who eats uh, flaming Hot Cheetos and watches SpongeBob. It doesn't matter. Can you imagine how stupid would Christianity be if it didn't matter what you did? Do we all get the same reward? No, but Jesus says, wait and what? And work. Wait and work because I'm coming back and I will reward you based on that work. So to help us understand this parable just a little bit better, I want to uh, introduce to you the three main characters here. I'm going to try pink. I don't know why, but I'm going to try pink. Um, So what did did you say? Somebody said something mean. Um, I'm going to start off with with the first character. Really, it was two, but we're going to combine them to one. There was somebody called the faithful servant. I know my butt's blocking you, but I'm going to move out of the way in just a second. The faithful was really two, but we're going to bring them into one because, in essence, they were the same. Um, Then there was a second character. Um, They were the unfaithful. Then there was the master our third character. Now, the faithful was really two, 
and the unfaithful was one, and the master was one. Now, the master represents Jesus. He's the master in the parable. The unfaithful, as you know, was the one with one BG, one bag of gold. BG. It's cute, huh, how he brought it down and made it simple. Then there was one who had five and one who had two BG. There were two that were faithful. And I want to point this out because I thought this is really interesting and kind of cool. Did you notice that the two that took their, their weight of measure, they took the, the wealth that the master had entrusted them, the two that were the faithful ones, did you notice that they went out and what did they do? They put it to work. That was the word that was used, work. They went out and they did something with what their master had given them. And you notice that both of them were blessed, that they got double the amount of what the master gave them, that there was immediate blessing. It wasn't like they went out and they tried and nothing happened. Jesus says, no, they gained double. Which is interesting to me that the two who tried did not fail, which is often something that we're afraid of, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Then, this was also the thing that, that stood out to me, that the two that were faithful not only were blessed and doubled what the master gave them, but did you notice that when the master came back, he rewarded them with giving them even more for their faithfulness. But, but there was one who was unfaithful. There was one who took his measure and he went and he buried it in the ground. And just so nobody like misunderstands this, the point of, of, of why Jesus chose the person who got the one, just the one bag, it wasn't to say that the people who are given the, the least by God will like not do anything with it. That wasn't the point. It wasn't that Jesus, it wasn't that God doesn't love people who have been given the least in gifts and money and things like that. That's not the point. The point is this, that even if you've been given one gift and you waste it, it's still a big deal to God. Even if you're given just one gift and you didn't do anything with it, let's say that the one gift you have in life is that you are a people person and you did nothing with that, God would consider it a waste and it would make him angry. Now next week we're going to be talking about money. But tonight I want to talk to you just about using the actual gifts that God's given you. Meaning not money, but specifically like talents, gifts that God's given you. But this is what's interesting to go back to the unfaithful. Notice that um, he did nothing, and what did he get? Nothing. <laughs> he did nothing, and he got nothing, and when the master returned, he was punished for doing nothing. Here's what's sad. and I, I'm not trying to like, make you feel like a horrible person or make you feel like a horrible Christian, but let's just be honest. There's some of us tonight, you don't do anything in your faith. You don't do anything that requires faith. You don't do anything to test your faith, to, to let God use you in any way, and then you look at your life and you're like, why don't I see God in my life? Why don't I feel close to God like I want to be? And, and here's this story that Jesus tells us, listen, if you do nothing with what God has given you, then guess what's going to happen? Nothing. He's like, hey, um, master, I buried it. Here's your gift back. The master didn't want his money back. He wanted him to do something with it. And understand this. The point of this story is that Jesus is a master. The point of this story is that he's given you certain gifts and yes, even money. And we're going to talk about that next week. And here's the thing. He didn't give it to you because he wants it back. Jesus doesn't need it. He doesn't need you. He wants to be proud of you. Let me give you an example. Um, I have my son, when he, my son Jonah, he'll make a mess of his room. I have him clean it up. We sing a song. We go, clean up, clean up, everybody clean up. You guys ever seen that song in like kindergarten? You guys remember that song? I sing that to my son, clean up, and he'll start picking up toys, ha, 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 and he'll like put it in the bucket. Here's the thing. I don't need him to clean it up. I want to be proud of him. I want to teach him how to do it so he's not some punk one day picking his butt on the couch watching my TV. I want him to learn at an early age to clean up, clean up after himself. You know what I'm saying? Wipe his own butt. All kinds of cool stuff like that. And that's why I teach him I don't need him to do it. I could wipe his butt for the rest of his life, but I don't want to. You understand? Like, I want him to learn the joy of bringing I don't know, pride to his parents or to make us proud. And this is the thing with Jesus is he, 
He is entrusting you with gifts. He's entrusting you with money, not because like God needs your money. It will get, do nothing for him in heaven. It's that he wants you to do something that he can one day reward you for. The master, you see, entrusted, it says. Go back to uh, verse 14. Just pulled up on the screen for us. Verse 14, first verse. He says what? The master goes on a journey, called his servants, and what? Entrusted his wealth to them. God trusts you with these gifts, with, with money that you have in your life. Some of you, your parents are, are rich. They have a lot of money, and you have an allowance, or you have a job, and you have money, and yet you spend it what? All on yourself, just on your own clothes. Oh, never, never do you try to use that money to bring glory to God. Never do you try to take your gifts and use them to bring glory to God. Some of you, let me give you some examples. Um, some of you have gifts. You're athletic, or you can sing, or you're smart. Um, whatever gift you have, I don't know, maybe you're, again, really, really good with people. But you have this gift. What are you doing with it? Because here's the thing, some of you have been trusted with a lot of gifts, a lot of gifts. Um, let me read this verse to you in Luke chapter 12. This is Jesus speaking again, and this is a warning to those that have been given much. Uh, verse 48, I'm just going to read you the second part of it. Jesus says this, from everyone who has been given much, that's some of you, your parents have a lot of money, they're pretty well off, you get an allowance. Others of you, it's that you have tons and tons of talents God has given you your life. From everyone who's been given much, pay attention, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The more God has given you, the more he expects you to do for him. The more God has entrusted to you, the more glory he expects you to bring to him. Did you notice, though, what held the unfaithful servant back from doing something with that money that, got, that his uh, master entrusted him with? Did you catch what his excuse was? He said, I didn't do it because I was what? Because I was afraid. Somebody said it too like this, fear. That fear kept him back from doing something with what God entrusted him with. You know, uh, we have a, a young lady here named Victoria Albrecht. She's sitting right there. And Victoria, uh, if you didn't know this, she's got, she's got a beautiful voice. Um, and for a very long time, she refused to sing at all. And one day, this guy, Chase Tenberge, forced her to sing in front of a few people. And then one, one night, uh, who was it? Was it Taylor that made you sing in front of Robert? Michaela uh, Holbrook, she used to be Binkowski, poor guy, he married her, but uh, <laughs> that's an old joke, but anyways, Michaela Holbrook um, made her sing in front of Robert, and that is why today she sings on stage, which she's, as I think you'd agree with me, one of the best singers that we have at our church. She's got an amazing voice, but we would have never heard it because she was afraid for so long. Hannah, Robert's daughter that sang tonight, same deal, was afraid. Robert tried forever to get her up there. She wouldn't do it. She was afraid to sing. Oh, I suck, Dad. Finally, he got her up there. I can tell you story after story. Robert was a drummer for years, had a good voice in hiding for years because he was afraid. Fear often holds us back. I'll talk about my own life for a second to show you that, um, that I even struggle with this a lot. Uh, when I first felt the call, to youth ministry, um, I wanted to just volunteer at the church. But I was afraid because of probably the reason why you don't volunteer. I struggled with sin. I, I struggled and I felt like I failed God a lot. And I remember I was doing this Bible study at the time and people were like, Chris, you, you know, you got a passion for teaching the Bible. You need to go volunteer at the church. You need to go work with high school students. And I was like, but dude, like, I'm just struggling. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. That's what I tell you. I'm going to pray about it. You probably tell people that all the time. I'm going to pray about it. You should sing. I'm going to pray about it. Pray about it. But you have the gift. I'm going to pray about it, all right? <laughs> and I said this for the longest time, and I'll never forget this one time um, after a Bible study, this, this four-year-old man named Jack. God spoke through Jack. He came up to me, this big dude, and uh, he's like, young man, I want to talk to you. I was so scared. I was like, he's going to kill me or something. And he took me in this other room. He's like, young man, he was like standing above me. Young man, you have a gift. 
And I was like, I do? He's like, yeah, you got a passion for teaching. He didn't say I was good. He just said that you have a passion for teaching God. You don't make a lot of sense, but you have a passion for teaching God's word. And I was like, I do? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you ever thought about doing something with that? You ever thought about volunteering in a church? And I was like, well, I've been praying about it, but I just don't know because um, I've made a lot of mistakes and uh, I'm just kind of praying about it. So if you could pray for me. He's like, hmm. Well, maybe you should stop praying about it, and maybe you should do something about it. I felt like he punched me in the nose. I was like, ow, ow. I was like, you know what? You're right, man. I was like, I should, I should, I should just do it. He's like, you should do it. He, like, walked away, and I was like, all right. So I signed up and started volunteering, and it's weird because the struggles I had in my life as I started pouring into high school students your age those struggles started to go away because I would tell them, I'd be like, yeah, guys, man, you can do this. Like the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says it's inside of us and you don't, you don't have to struggle with lust anymore. And I was like, man, I should like stop struggling with lust. And like I started believing what I was saying and as I started to pour out, I started to grow. And then I had to deal with this fear. I felt called now to be a pastor but there's a problem. I had a fear of public speaking. Some of you are like, what? No way. Yeah, like I was the type, you probably don't remember this. Um, some of you were here in the very beginning when we first started Ignite. I remember you. Like Richard, you were here. I used to, I used to preach up here and I would be hiding behind that wall and, and, and I would get, you guys, I would get so nervous. I would start sweating. I would be shaking and I'd always have to pee. I'd be back there like, ah. I gotta go pee. And then I'd always go up there. Can I go? Oh, I can't. I gotta go up. And I'd always have to pee. I'd always get sweaty and shaky. My voice would go hoarse and all this stuff. And I would get so nervous. And now I would just go up there and I would just preach anyways. And it was weird because I had this passion for preaching, but I was so, so afraid. And here's my point is that fear almost kept me as an unfaithful servant. And I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but God has confirmed to me that preaching, teaching is my gift. And I hope you don't think that I'm like, and I'm kind of awesome, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this, that God has confirmed that this is my gift because people like you, some of you, have told me, oh, God spoke to me tonight, and, and hey, I appreciate you using your gift, and some of you that are nice, you've encouraged me. And, and so God has confirmed this, but here's the thing, I almost let fear hold me back, and if I would have let that happen, I would have never allowed God to use me to bring him glory. And I hope you don't, some of you think I suck at preaching. That's fine. I agree with you most of the time. Sometimes I think I'm okay, but most of the time I don't even like myself. And, and the thing is that you might think I suck, but that's not the point. The point is this, that, that I would have never been used to bring God glory if I would have held on to that fear. And if Jack wouldn't have punched me in the face that one day, I probably would have never even started volunteering. And my point is this, that it's so easy for us to let fear hold us back, to let fear keep us from being the faithful servant. And every single one of these servants that went out, there's only two of them, but you get my point, both of them that went out and did something, what happened? Double the reward. And when the master came back, he gave them even more. What's the point? That we're so afraid of failing and we're so afraid that we're gonna make some mistake and what if it's not my gift? What if I sing but everyone's like, you suck. Well, the point is this, that if you think that you have this gift, why not try to do something about it? Because Jesus says that the two that actually went out and did something about it, that they doubled, that they were blessed and that the master came back and rewarded them. So some of you might be like, okay, how do I start, Chris? I want to start, I want to do this. Well, we're not going to be talking about your own personal journey tonight. I, I could talk about this, but I'm not. I'm not going to talk about, hey, here's what you can do. Go out and, you know, start singing or something like that. What we're going to talk about tonight is going back to the original vision behind this series that we are trying to together as a youth ministry, be a part of what's happening in our church. The Catalyst Initiative is, you're going to hear it if you go to church on Sundays. And what the Catalyst Initiative is, is the Catalyst Initiative is our building campaign. It's us as a church gathering this money together to put a building, one day even our own Ignite building on the church property. And this is how you can be a part of that. Um, before I get into it, I'm going to give you three, um, three ways that you can be a part of it tonight. And again, you can go bring glory to God in your own life in different ways, but tonight... We're going to be talking about 
how we together as a youth ministry, Ignite Together, can bring glory to God by putting a building on the church property. Before I talk about that, let me just kind of paint this picture for you. I don't know if you ever realized this, but a church building is the best way we can reach people in this community. I'm not saying the entire world. It's different depending on where you are. But in this community, this is the best way we can reach people for Christ. And I'll tell you why. This school we're meeting in, it's pretty cool. It's not going to be as cool as our Ignite building, but it's pretty cool. But we could get kicked out tomorrow. In fact, in New York, they've kicked out all the churches that go to schools. They said, you're not allowed to meet in schools anymore. We could get kicked out tomorrow. Then where are we going to go? Your house? Yeah, right. You think we can do this at your house? No way. Your parents would hate us. And, and so the point is that when we put that building on that church property, that's something that no one ever can take away. The point is that somebody, like a friend of yours, is going to drive past our church building for years till they're like 30. And one day they're going to be visiting their parents in Eastvale and go, you know what, I'm going to check out Vantage Point Church. And they're going to one day for the very first time stop by and check out our church. Why? Because they've been driving past that building for years. And here's the thing I want you to imagine. One day, we're going to walk into this Ignite building with or without your help. One day, we're going to walk in this Ignite building, and you get to either look around and go, yo, I made this happen, y'all. Or you get to walk in and go, thanks, guys. (laughs) Thanks. It means a lot. Who wants to see what the, bu- the building's going to look like one day? Does anybody want to know? <laughs> Drum roll, please. Three, two, one. Let's see it. Bring it up for us. In all its glory. And I know what some of you are thinking. What is this? A center for ants? <laughs> no. This will one day be bigger. And um, here's what's cool. See the building to the right that's tall. See, okay, see the little vantage point? Above that, there's a tall building. Guess what? That's going to be the Ignite building. (laughs) Pretty awesome, if you ask me. You can see like a little red, like, um, umbrella. That's one of our umbrellas, because we're going to have, we're going to have a little view of the river. What's that river called? Santa Ana River. We're going to have a view of the Santa Ana River right there. It's going to be amazing. That's going to be our Ignite building. Now, some of it's like boring and white, but we haven't figured out everything. But base, that's a basic idea. And the main auditorium is going to be to the left, that huge building with all the windows. That's going to be our main auditorium. So you, you can leave that up. Actually, go to the next one. Cool, just so you can get a, another shot. So that's um, the little splash pad we're going to have. And see that little grassy area? The grassy knoll, as we call it. Uh, That's where people can get married. How cool is that? They can get married right there. Um, So pretty cool. But, um, or they can just have fun. I don't know. But the point is that um, this is kind of a basic idea, a basic concept. We're going to fill in a lot of holes that we don't know what we're going to do with yet. But that's a basic concept. And you can leave that up. But here's the thing. I want you to start staring at this. I want you to start seeing this vision with us. Because this is going to happen with or without your help. But let me give you three ways that you can help. Number one. You don't have to take notes or anything. I hope you have a really good memory. But number one, um, we're going to fundraise. Some of you might be like, I don't got no money. Yes, you do. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, that's number three. I'll get to that. But, but we're going to fundraise because I know that a lot of you don't have a lot of money. So um, Athena and our Brave Ministry. Brave Ministry, where are you at? You out there? Anybody here? There's some Brave Ministry? Okay, cool. Like five of you. Um, but the Brave Ministry actually exists of like 30 of our students. But... Um, they normally do outreach stuff in the community. We're going to partner with them by doing these outreach events that are going to raise money, excuse me, for our church building. And one cool thing we're going to do, I'm not going to share all of them. we got some ideas for you guys. It's going to be cool on how we're going to raise money. One idea, this is kind of weird, but I like it. Um, I, I have this idea that I want to do a pig, a catch the pig race. Have you guys ever seen this? Basically, you have to catch a pig, but it's way cooler than that. You release the pig, and everybody runs and tries to get it, and the winner gets this big prize, and that's one idea I have, and you sell raffle tickets to make it in, but I just, I'm just excited to see people falling over each other and elbowing each other just to get a pig. I'm excited about that, but we have different other ideas that are better than that. That's just my crazy idea, but we're going to do different fundraisers to raise money to make this happen. And so we want to invite you to be a part of that. So on your way out of service, you want to be a part of that. You're going to sign up 
You're going to see Matt Fujita on your way out. And you're going to sign up on the sign-up sheet to say, hey, I want to be a part of that. This is just one way that you can be a part of putting this building on our church property. The second way is through prayer. Um, prayer is powerful. And I'll tell you this, too, that I need your prayer, and so does the Vantage Point staff, Pastor Mark, Pastor Tom. We need your prayer, as this is the most difficult thing we're probably going to ever do as a church. Satan attacks us a lot during this time period because we're making a difference for the kingdom of God. And... Um, and pray. Pray for us. We could really use your prayer. And if you want to sign up to be a part of this, um, this prayer initiative, on your way out, you're going to see Jessica, and you're going to sign up. And what you're going to sign up for is to commit to praying every day at 3 p.m. for three minutes. It doesn't seem like much, but it's a big deal. Why 3 o'clock? Because that's when most of y'all get out of school. And if I said like 8 a.m., you would never do it. So um, we're going to do it at 3 p.m. for three minutes every day. Sign up on your way out of service. Last thing is money. And we're going to talk about this more next week on how you can start making money or use the money that you're making right now. But that is next week. Three ways you can help out. Fundraiser signing up, prayer signing up, or three money. And we're going to talk about that next week. Um, before we close, I want to tell you one more story um, that Jesus once told to illustrate the importance of what we do about being the faithful servant. Jesus once was being questioned by the religious leaders. They were angry with him. And while he was being questioned, Jesus decided to tell him a story. He said, there was a man who had two sons. And one of those sons, uh, the man went up to, the father went up to, and he said to that one son, uh, hey, I want you to go out and work in the field today. That son told his father, no. I don't feel like it. I'm in the middle of a really good Xbox game, and just no, no, not today, Dad. You always do this. You just make me stop in the middle of my day and go do what you want. Not today, Dad. I'm not doing it. His father, disappointed, walked out and went to his other son. Went to his other son. He said, son, will you please go work out in the field? Your brother gave me a hard time. I'd really appreciate it if you could help me out. So the younger son said, yeah, Dad. Praise the Lord, I will. I'm going to go out right now. So the father said, thank you, son. That really means a lot. The father then walked out, and the second son stayed there, and he started playing Candy Crush on his phone. <laughs> then the first son, as he was playing Minecraft on his Xbox, he felt convicted. He turned it off, and he went out in the field and started working. Then Jesus asked him a question. He said, which one was the faithful son? And the religious leader said, the first son. And here's what's funny. So many of you, and I'm myself included, I'm being honest tonight, we're that unfaithful servant. God gives us a gift. The master gives us a gift. And we're like, praise the Lord. Yes, God, I will do something with this. Then he goes away. Jesus gives us a gift and trusts us with it. You know what we do? We're that second son. Yes, Lord, but we do nothing. In fact, some of you are gonna go sign up and you do this all the time. You sign up and we text you and you don't do jack. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just being honest. You're that person that's like, yes, and then you do nothing. And here's my challenge to you, do something. You may be that first son that's like, ah, oh, but I don't, I'm so busy. But be that son that actually follows through and does something. My challenge to you tonight is to be that faithful servant. Because one day you're going to stand in front of Jesus and you're going to either hear one of two things. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to be honest with you. This is a promise, you guys. This isn't a threat from Jesus to scare us. This is a promise. This will happen. Either one day you will stand in front of your king and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that is what I hope to hear one day. You guys, I'll, I'll admit, I feel like I fail you all the time as your pastor. I forget to pray for you. I, I feel like I don't do a very good job sometimes. I really feel like that. A lot of times I feel like a failure. But I'll tell you what, you guys, I will, I don't know if this is possible, but I will cry in heaven if I'm allowed to. I don't know if tears are allowed in heaven or not. But if they are, I know I will cry when he says those words because that's what I long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. I mess up all the time, but I'll tell you what, guys, I try. That's why I long to hear those words. And for you, you will either hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or you will hear, what a 
waste. What a waste. I gave you so much and you did nothing. I spoke to you over and over again and you walked out and buried your treasure. You went out and did nothing in the field. You just did nothing. You did absolutely nothing. Because of fear, because of busyness, because of whatever, you did nothing. You'll hear one of two things. But tonight, whatever it would be tonight, it doesn't have to stay that way. It can change. You can make that decision. Lord, we, uh, we thank you, God, for the fact that, um, <laughs> that you warn us, Lord. Jesus, that you loved us enough to warn us, that you loved us enough to give us the answers before the test, that you loved us enough, God, that before, before we ever stood before you, you tell us exactly what's going to happen. There will be no surprises on that day. It will happen exactly as you promise it will happen. But Jesus, I want to pray for the students that are here tonight because I know, Lord, that it was a sacrifice that that for a guy sitting here tonight, he had a temptation. Somebody invited him to go somewhere, but he chose to to come here tonight. For for a young lady tonight, Lord, that they were invited to go to a place, but they came here for, for that person tonight that had homework, that had a lot going on, but they chose to come here and meet with you. God, I pray for them that as you've spoken to them tonight, Lord, that your word would not return void as you promised, that that there would be fruit, that there would be a stirring in their heart, that they would be that faithful servant, that, that good son or daughter that walks out of this room and not only signs up, but shows up. That not only signs up, but prays. Prays faithfully for, for me because I need it. For our staff, Lord, we pray for a stirring within the hearts of these students. Um, so that they can be a part of this beautiful moment where one day we get to unlock the doors, we get to open them up, and we get to have a party, Lord, and celebrate what we did together as a church. Let that be prophecy tonight. Let that be the beginning tonight, Lord, a stirring in our hearts. We love you. We praise your name.